morning. Good morning. It's good to welcome you here this morning to worship at First Baptist. We're glad you're here, but more importantly, we know that you're here for a reason, and we're glad that God has brought you here. And our goal is to see what God has to say for you this morning. We just want to call a few things uh, going on in the life of our church to your attention. Um, continue to remember that uh, we are doing uh, Bible studies on Wednesday evening. So in the hall right behind me, uh, the fellowship hall, we have an adult Bible study going on. We have activities for children, have activities for our young people. So come be a part of our Wednesday evening. A choir started back last week. So if you're a choir member, uh, uh, we're going to, we meet in here in the sanctuary, but we're going to continue to meet. And our hopes are to get our choir back in our worship services very soon. Our senior adults had a great activity this last week, and we're going to continue with our senior adult schedule starting in October. So you'll see a reference to that as we begin our luncheon uh, the October 13th. So uh, right now we're bringing our own lunch, but we'll have a guest speaker and, uh, and then uh, participate in a game day together. We're glad you're here. This morning we got a very special service as we uh, do our baby dedication, which we had to postpone in the month of May. But we want to continue to uh, lift our church and lift our uh, country up in our prayers. This morning I'm going to ask Frank Couch. Is Frank here? Well, that's two weeks in a row that our prayer person had been. I don't line those up, but I'll pray for us. Let's pray together. Father, we just thank you that you have given us the privilege and the opportunity to be here this morning. Father, we know that we aren't here by accident, that you have ordained us to be here in your presence. So, Father, there is a reason, there is a purpose that we are here. So we just ask, Father, that, that, that we'll not allow Satan to distract us this morning from what you have to tell us, from that purpose, Father, that you have proposed for us to be together. Father, we certainly want to continue to pray for your touch on our church, on our families. Father, as you keep them safe during this unpredictable time of sickness and illness. But Father, we also pray for our nation. Father, so much unrest. We look around us and we feel like nobody is in control. But Father, don't let Satan fool us. Father, remind us that you're always in control. And Father, we don't need to do anything but continue to bow our knee. Father, to, to call on you to intervene. And we know, Father, that you will answer that promise that you will continue, Father, to, to play an active role in our lives and in this world. We pray for our leaders and just pray, Father, that you'll continue to humble them before you. May they realize, Father, that without you, they can do nothing. Father, without your providence, without your help, without your strength, they're powerless. So, Father, will you just, will you just bring that to the center of their very souls so they understand it. And, Father, they act on everything by first, first bathing it in prayer. Remind us that it starts with us, though, Father. Satan wants us to wring our hands and to sit around and worry, but you want us to actively call on you and, Father, to do as exactly you guide us to do. We just pray, Father, that you'll remind us of that every day and that we'll be willing to bow our knees in reverence to you. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. I mean, if we want God to be first in our lives, then we need to place our foundation as Jesus Christ. Will you stand with me as we continue our worship and join us on this chorus, Firm Foundation. Jesus is our firm foundation. Amen. Sing it with us. Here we go.
Another beautiful, lovely fall morning. Um, it's good to be together. And, uh, you know, we look forward to our parent-child dedication every year. We normally do this on Mother's Day, and it just kind of just makes for a very festive occasion. Uh, since we were unable to do that this past Mother's Day, we're going to do that in the fall rather than to wait a whole another year until next Mother's Day. And so I'm going to ask for uh, our six... Uh, families to please come and bring your child up to the altar at this time. Uh, these are the six children that uh, have indicated that they are prepared to dedicate their child to the Lord this morning. All right, y'all come on, come on over and kind of get in the center right here in front of the altar table. All right. Isn't this a good looking group? Yes. Okay. Now I'm going to ask you to turn and face me, if you would, for just a moment for our uh, vows to the Lord. Okay. Are we ready? All right. Do you stand before God our Father? And this, our church family today, to dedicate your child to the Lord, and in so doing, to dedicate yourselves to raising your child in a Christian home where Jesus Christ will be loved and honored. If you promise, would you say we do? Would you please turn now and face the congregation? Congregation, do you as a family of faith commit yourselves to love and support these families by faithfully teaching the word of God and by lovingly providing the Christian ministries that will assist them in fulfilling this holy promise to God? Would you say we do? Okay. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the miracle of these new lives that you've brought into the world. Every time a child is born, we're just reminded you've not given up on us yet. So, Father, bless these parents and these children. We know you have a, a wonderful plan and a purpose for their lives. And we just ask that you be with these moms and dads and help them to know that they are never alone. Help them to be reassured by your grace and your presence throughout the years of their children's lives and help us as a congregation to support them with our love and our prayers and to be with them always whenever we're needed. We thank you for what you will do in Christ's holy name we pray and God's people said amen. <clears throat> okay I'm going to call the names of these six babies in alphabetical order and Miss Laura Ludwig our children's minister is going to hand them a gift from our church family. First, we have Landon Grace Bice, born October 16th, 2019. Parents are Adam and Devin Bice. Grandparents are Derek and Susan Vansant, and Carrie and Dawn Bice. Next, we have Millie Ann Deese, born July 3rd, 2018. Parents are Megan and Eric Deese, and grandparents Tim and Tracy Billingsley. And then we have Mercer Evelyn Dowdy, born June 27th, 2020. Parents are Jeremy and Joy Dowdy. Grandparents, Dee and Donna McDaniel and Angie Ryan. Then we have Theodore Wood Hutton, born January 20th, 2020. Parents are Tyler and Bethany Hutton and grandparents, Mike and Martha Bentley.
Then we have Graham Billingsley Oliver, born October 9th, 2019. Parents are Kaylin and Jacob Oliver. Grandparents, Tim and Tracy Billingsley. Stacy and Heath Childers, and the late Greg Oliver. And then we have Catherine Elizabeth Thomas, born October 24th, 2019. Parents are Justin and Jennifer Thomas. Grandparents, David and Melissa Thomas, and Charles and Linda Merrill. Let's give them all a big hand. Okay, thank you all for presenting your child today, and please be assured of our prayers for you in the days ahead. You may be seated. Wasn't that great? It's just uh, does us good as a church family to see these beautiful new families and their babies. Okay. And I'm, I'm amazed. Uh, this is uh, like the 28th time that uh, we've done this uh, uh, since I've been here. And uh, never once can I remember a, a child crying and you know interrupting things it's, they've just always been so so beautiful and so perfect okay well this morning we continue our, our series of messages we've been looking at uh, the book of hebrews in the new testament and this morning we're talking about never letting go never letting go there was a, a dearly loved elderly pastor who decided to retire after many years in the ministry and on Sunday morning, he announced his decision to the congregation. And in doing so, he said, I'm wearing two hearing aids, trifocal glasses, false teeth, and I walk with a cane. It seems that the Lord is telling me it's time to quit. And after the service, a white-haired uh, little lady came up to him and said, Pastor, I believe you've misinterpreted what the Lord is saying to you. He's not telling you it's time to retire. He's simply telling you that if you keep serving him, he'll give you the strength to carry on. Well, that's essentially the message here in Hebrews chapter 4. These original hearers were believers who were going through uh, very difficult and, and uncertain times. They were living under the constant threat of persecution for their faith. Uh, they were mostly Jewish converts to Christianity, but they, they, they looked to their Jewish friends and they found that, that their Jewish friends were not being persecuted like they were. Only followers of Christ were uh, being given such a hard time by the Romans. So you have these believers uh, who are suffering for their faith and they're struggling and they're having a terrible time. Meanwhile, their Jewish friends and family are just going to the synagogue as, as usual. They're not being persecuted. They're not being beaten or imprisoned for their faith. They're not losing their livelihood because of their faith. And so you know, here's Uncle Joe and Sister Susie and Mom and Dad or Mima saying, Hey, come on back over to the synagogue and worship with us. You know, we're, we're just having a, a great time in the Lord and we're enjoying the peace of God. And after all, you know, we're worshiping the same God anyway, right? So God is blessing us and maybe he's punishing you because look at the hard time that you're getting from the Romans. And so why don't you forget all this nonsense about Jesus being the Messiah and just come on back to the synagogue where you belong. And let's just all worship together in peace. Well, that must have sounded pretty appealing to some of these first century followers of Jesus. It, it seems that, that some of those believers in Christ were really tempted to do just that, to go back to their old ways, to fall away from their Christian confession, to let go of their faith in Jesus, and to return to the synagogue to worship God without the threat of persecution. Sounded pretty good to him, I'm sure. But the author of Hebrews would have none of that. He calls upon these believers in, in no uncertain terms to hold firmly 
to hold on to your faith in the living Christ and to never let go. In essence, he's saying to them, keep on believing and keep on trusting, keep on living out your faith, as difficult as it may be, as, as many times as you may be tempted to, to go back, just keep on keeping on, because if you do, God will enable you and empower you to carry on. And then he gives them four spiritual truths, motivational truths, if you will, to keep on keeping on. Number one, he says, remember the promise of God's rest. Remember the promise of God's rest. Let's begin reading here in verse 1 of chapter 4 of Hebrews. Since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. For we have also had the good news promised to us, just as they did, but the message they heard was of no value to them because they did not share the faith of those who obeyed. Now we who have believed and have believed enter that rest, and there remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following their example and disobedience. So God is a God of promises, right? I mean, this book is a book of promises, right? From Genesis to Revelation, the Bible affirms over and over again that God not only makes promises to his people, but he always keeps those promises, it's impossible for God to tell a lie, and it's impossible for God to not keep a promise. So the Bible says that God promises this rest for his people. What does that mean? What kind of rest is he talking about? Well, the book of Genesis records that after God had completed his work of creating the heavens and the earth and everything in it, that he, what, he rested on the seventh day after creation, right? And when Jesus came into the world, he proclaimed, we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day because the night comes when no one can work. And before he drew his last breath on the cross, what did he say? It is finished, meaning my work is finished. What I've come to do, my mission, my work in this world is finished. And so the writer of Hebrews says that after Christ had provided for the purification of our sins, he sat down on the right hand of God in heaven. He rested, in other words. So we see in Scripture there's this divine pattern here of work followed by rest. God worked to create the heavens, and then he rested. Jesus came and did his work of salvation for us, and then he sat down on God's right hand. He rested, right, from his work. Now, the Bible says that, that we, as people of God, are to work. If we're to be godly, then we have to be like our God, right? And so we are to be people of work. That we are chosen to serve him. We have a, a God-ordained mission to, to, to carry out. Paul admonished the Philippians to work out your salvation, and when the writer of Hebrews says, let's make every effort to enter that rest, he's talking about work. This phrase literally means work hard in order to rest. Work and then rest. Before you can enjoy rest, you got to work. And, 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 you know, you always rest best after you've worked hardest, right? Now, a few of you can remember maybe back in the good old days, any of you grew up on a farm, and, uh, you know, the farmer would rise up at the crack of dawn and work in the fields all day with a mule and a plow, and then come home in the evening and eat a big old supper, and then what? Go to bed. You went to bed with the chickens, you got up with the chickens, you worked hard all day, you slept hard at night, right? I mean, you, you had to rest. And Jesus is telling us that that is what we are to be about. We are to be busy working for him. God's people are to work. 
What are we to work at? I'm glad you asked. At demonstrating our faith through humble obedience. He's not talking about a works salvation here. He's not saying that we need to go out and, and work in order to earn the favor of God. That's not what he's saying. We are to work hard at trusting God. We are to, to work hard at, at doing the things of God. Serving God and others, uh, loving others, and living out our faith. Have you discovered that loving people is hard work? Have you discovered this? Loving people is not easy, especially if you're trying to love somebody who's not very lovable, right? It's hard work. You got to work at it. You got to work. You got to put forth some effort to love people in a, the self giving, self sacrificing way of our Lord and Savior. You got to work hard at forgiving people. You got to work hard at, at reconciling your differences and, and just putting up with certain things. I mean, you, you got to work. Spiritual, the spiritual life is a life of, of hard work. There's much work to be done. Somebody said there's no coasting in the Christian life. No coasting in God's kingdom. Because you can only coast in one direction, and it's not upward, right? So, God's work is always hard work. But after the work comes, then the rest. And the harder the work, the better the rest. What kind of rest is this? Well, first of all, you see in your outline there, it's, first of all, it's a it's a present rest. We enjoy this rest here and now. Uh, in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Jesus said, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. This is a, a kind of rest the believer enters into and experiences right now. Right now, it's a present rest. We enjoy a, a certain rest in this life. Not a lack of activity. He's not talking about doing nothing. He's talking about peace and the joy that comes with serving the Lord. He's not, he's, he's, he's talking more about <clears throat> the absence of <clears throat> anguish, the absence of worry and anxiety. He's talking about. Uh, how our burdens are lifted through our faith in Christ. So we give him our trust and he lifts our burdens. He removes our anxieties as we put our trust in him. He's talking about living a victorious Christian life. That's a type of spiritual rest that, that only God's people can enjoy. A life of peace and joy and harmony with God and others. Living life on a higher plane, not wallowing around in the muck and mire of this broken world. That's the salvation that Christ came to give us. And it begins right now, the moment we receive him. We get that rest. But there's another kind of rest. With that being said, we need to understand that this rest in its fullness, in its completeness, remains a promised destination for the future. It's a future rest. It is a future rest. The, the promise of heaven. Notice what John said in Revelation. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. They will rest from their labor. Heaven is where God's people will rest permanently from their sorrows and their sicknesses and their sins. It's where we will rest forever from our tears and our trials and our temptations. There's no more of, of, of all of that that we have to deal with in the brokenness of this world. So it's a permanent rest. Heaven is the hope of, of every, every follower of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. The hope of heaven is a powerful force in the Christian life. It, it motivates God's people to persevere in their faith, to keep holding on, to keep on keeping on, to keep trusting God, to keep living out your faith. The hope, uh, this, the hope is what, what fills our lives full of meaning, right? 
He gives us hope for today and tomorrow and forever. And it means that everything that we do for Christ matters. It matters because He is watching. <coughs> and we're living for those rewards of our faithfulness that we will enjoy for eternity. All the hard work for God's kingdom will be remembered and will be rewarded. C.S. Lewis once said that if you read history, he said you will find that the people who did the most for this present world were precisely those who thought the most of the world to come. How true that is. It's a motivating force for us as the people of God, knowing that our, our future rest is coming. We live in that hope, therefore we are motivated to make a difference in this life until we get to that life to come. Our hope in Christ gives us strength to hold firmly to our faith during difficult and uncertain times. But there's a second step. He says, to holding on to our faith in Christ. Secondly, we need to remain in God's word. <clears throat> and when we remain in God's word, we are motivated and we are strengthened to do the work of God and to trust him in faith. Notice what he says in Hebrews 4.12. The word of God is active and alive, sharper than any double-edged sword, it penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. So a healthy dependence on God's word enables us to persevere in our faith for, for a couple of reasons. First, you see on your outline, because God's word is powerful. It is powerful. The writer of Hebrews says it's active and alive, which means it possesses a power that makes it effective in carrying out God's intentions. It's, it's transforming, life-changing. It is a sustaining kind of power. God speaks through His words. He empowers and encourages us. He inspires us. He instructs us. He convicts us. He corrects us through Scripture. So focusing our minds on God's Word will keep us close to Him and will strengthen our faith. You know, people who take daily vitamins do so because they believe <clears throat> that over a period of time, uh, their vitamin supplements will strengthen their physical health and their resistance to illness and improve their overall well-being. The same is true of studying Scripture. Sometimes God's Word will have a, a sudden life-changing impact upon us. But the real value lies in the effects of a long-term exposure to God's Word. When we are regularly exposed to the Word of God over a long period of time, it keeps us close to Him. It keeps us clean. It convicts us of our need. It just keeps us close to the Lord. And it empowers and enables us to be the kind of people that he wants us to be. God's word is powerful. And if you've been a follower, of, if you've been a devoted follower of Christ for any length of time, you know the importance and the power of God's word. But it's not only powerful, it's also penetrating. It's Penetrating. God examines his people through his word. He holds them accountable by it. <clears throat> he says it's sharper than a double-edged sword, which emphasizes its penetrating force. It cuts to the very soul and spirit, which refers to the inner person. God is able to take his surgeon's knife and see into the very heart and soul of a person. The penetrating power of God's word is able to, to probe our, our innermost thoughts. The thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing is hidden from God's sight. We talked about this a little bit last week. You know, one day every person is going to stand before a holy God. And everything is going to be open and laid bare before 
this holy God, these all-seeing eyes, and a person's behavior will be held up against the standard of God's revealed word. And the very thought of this inevitable, this sobering experience should be enough to keep us holding firmly to the faith that we profess. So first, we need to remember the promise of God's rest. It's a motivating force, motivating us to serve Him and others faithfully. And then we need to remain in the Word of God, allowing His Word to penetrate into our hearts and to change us and renew us daily. And then thirdly, we need to recognize God's nearness. Recognize God's nearness. Let's begin reading in verse 14. <clears throat> Since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with us with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, <clears throat> just as we are, yet he did not sin. So Jesus is our high priest. That's a major theme in the book of Hebrews. We need to recognize the significance of that statement. In the Old Testament, the high priest kind of was the overseer over the ritual worship of God, and he kind of functioned as the representative between God and man. He alone entered into the most holy place on the annual day of atonement to make a sacrifice for the sins of his people. And as the great high priest, Jesus did this for us once and for all. And we are cleansed, we are purified spiritually because of his work on the cross. He made the ultimate sacrifice for our sins. So we also need to recognize the significance of Jesus' empathy. Because he has been tempted in every way like we have, he can empathize with us in our weaknesses. The word empathize means being compassionate to the point of helping. He has walked the human pathway. He understands what we are up against because he's been here, right? He's walked our way. He doesn't stand at a detached distance and kind of coldly observe our struggles. No, he is our present help in our time of need. In fact, because of his work as a high priest, he makes it possible, he makes possible this continual access to God. In other words, God is no longer separated from people. You know, it used to be <coughs> in the Old Testament days, the presence of God dwelt in the very Holy of Holies in the temple, separated by this veil, separated from the people. God, when Christ died upon the cross and that veil was rent from top to bottom, it represented the fact that there's no longer any separation between a holy God and a sinful people. The veil's been done away with, and every person may now enjoy intimacy with God through faith in Jesus Christ. We may now approach God's throne with, with confidence, not because of anything we've done, but because of what Christ has done for us as our great high priest. Now, under the old covenant, only the high priest had the privilege of entering into God's presence, and he only once a year. But under Jesus' high priesthood, every believer may now live in the very presence of God day by day on a continual basis. What a difference. God's no longer out there. God's no longer up there. God's no longer in this building over here. God is with us, Emmanuel. God with us. That's what Jesus came to offer us. What a difference that makes. It makes all the difference in our lives, doesn't it? It means that we're never alone, that whatever we face in life, whatever challenge, whatever problem, <clears throat> whatever chasm, whatever dark, deep valley we have to walk through, He is with us. He is our 
constant and abiding friend. An old pastor relates the story of when he was a boy growing up in a congested inner city neighborhood. His mother arranged for a teenage girl who lived nearby to, to walk with him to and from school each day. But when he was in the second grade, then he begged and pleaded with his mother to allow him to walk to school unescorted because he was getting to be a big boy now. And after a period of time, he finally persuaded his mother. And for the next few years, he walked by himself, an only child, he walked by himself back and forth to school. Years later, at a family gathering, he was kind of boasting about his independence. And he reminded his family about how he had taken care of himself as a young boy and walked to school by himself. And suddenly, his mother just began to laugh. She said, did you really think that you were alone? She said, every morning when you left for school, I left with you. You just didn't know it. I walked behind you all the way. And, and when you got out of school in the afternoon, I was there. I kept myself hidden, but I was always there just in case you needed me. The Heavenly Father is always present with us, whether we recognize Him or not. He's always here. Living in the presence of God has tremendous implications for us. It means that, you know, whatever challenges you face in life, God is there to help you to overcome them. Whatever temptation you face, God is there to, to empower you and enable you to do the right thing. It matters no, no matter how difficult the circumstance, God is there and he makes all the difference by his presence. Because we have access to God at all times, it's possible not only to hold on to our faith, but also to enjoy the peace and the presence of God in the midst of all the adversities of life. So, remember the promise of God's rest. There's a better day coming. Remember to, to remain in God's word. And recognize God's nearness. There's the fourth step. If we do these three steps, the fourth one is almost automatic, isn't it? And that is to rearrange life's priorities. Rearrange life's priorities. Hebrews 4.16. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. You know, when we accomplish these first three steps, then it's hard not to do the fourth one, isn't it? I mean, when we remember the promise of God's rest for us, and when we remain in His Word and we recognize His nearness, how can we not rearrange the priorities of our lives? So as you live out your faith, then your priorities begin to reflect the truth of God's Word. Our priorities become less and less about me and more and more about, about him. And as I mature in my faith, I begin to realize, hey, you know, it, it's really not about me. It's not about my comfort. It's not about my convenience. It's not about what's easy for me. I begin to live unselfishly as I become more and more like Christ. I approach God's throne with grace and confidence, which refers to prayer, of course. So my life becomes a, an ongoing conversation with God. As I commune with Him, I find two priceless treasures. I find God's mercy, which takes care of my past failures, and I find God's grace, which takes care of my current needs. God's mercy takes care of my past, God's grace takes care of my present. God's mercy and God's grace meet all of my needs and enables me to hold firmly to the faith I profess. I remember when I was a little kid, my dad took me downtown to where he worked, and um, we were there standing on the corner of a busy downtown street, and I was kind of nervous and frightened as a little kid. All the cars zooming by and just activity everywhere. And as the light 
changed and it became time for us to walk across that busy downtown street my father reached down his big old hand and took care took hold of my little hand and all of a sudden I felt safe all of a sudden I was at peace I was no longer afraid no longer worried because my hand was in the hand of my father and I knew that my father would not let go of my hand until I had crossed to the other side our Heavenly Father reaches out his eternal hand to us you and I when we're willing to place our hand in his we have a peace that passes all human understanding we have the presence of the living God who will never leave us nor forsake us. We know that he has a plan and a purpose. He gives us his holy word to strengthen us, to examine us, to keep us close and clean to him. He purifies us from all unrighteousness. And he promises never to let us down. Put your hand, reach out a hand of faith. Put your hand in his today and rest assured that you will never, for the rest of your life, you'll never walk alone. And he'll never put any challenge before you that you and he cannot handle together. Let's pray together. Father, we confess to you this morning that uh, for some of us, life has been very hectic and very uncertain lately. Lord, for some of us, life is just difficult at best. And we're tempted to fall away from our faith. We're tempted, Lord, to let go of that grip. But we know that your word tells us that you'll never let go of us. We thank you for that that assurance. Help us, Lord, to hold on to our faith and to live out our faith every day of our lives. Not because we have to, but because we want to, because we have a heart, a desire to please you and to bring others into your kingdom. So, Lord, encourage us today. Help us to return to you, reignite that fire within us, strengthen our faith, encourage us, Show us the way. Lord, for, for that one that's carrying a heavy burden today, we just pray that you would remind us all that burdens are lifted at Calvary. And that's what our great high priest came to do for us, to lift our burden of guilt and sin and struggle and to give us a peace that passeth all understanding. So strengthen us today, Father. Have your way among us. In Christ's holy name we ask it. And God's people said, Amen. We're going to stand and sing a hymn of invitation. I'll be waiting down front to pray with you, to receive you, whatever need you may have as we stand and sing this morning. You come as God speaks to you. I have decided to follow Jesus. I
from the journey that Brother Mike was talking about this morning all begins at Calvary. To hold that hand that God holds out, we need to trust in what Jesus has done for us as his blood was shed on the cross. Thank you, 
Charles for singing that great old hymn. Uh, it's good to see y'all this morning. Uh, haven't you enjoyed the wonderful fall weather we've been having lately? Hope that you'll join us this Wednesday night. We've got a full schedule, 6.30 to 7.30, Bible study for adults. We're continuing to go through the gospel according to Luke on Wednesday nights, and then our children and youth have their events as well, and hope to see you then. Let's stand for our closing prayer together. And um, I think uh, A.J. Cole is going to come and, and lead us in, in our prayer. A.J. has been our youth intern over the last several weeks, doing a great job. We appreciate him, a great young man. Lead us as we pray, A.J. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just, Lord, I just want to come to you with uh, gratitude this morning. Lord, I'm so thankful to be a part of a church that's just constantly working, Lord. A church that even amidst this virus, we're working to get everybody back and comfortable, Lord. Um, Lord, that we could serve you and that we could still be the church amongst this virus. God, let us, uh, let us continue to work and continue to work hard for you because there's always work to be done. And then that rest will feel deserved. Um, so let us work hard this week and uh, keep us safe throughout the week, Lord. We pray all this in your name. Amen.